me, we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York, the 10th of January, 2007, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? John J. O'Brien. Place of birth, New York City, 92329. Okay. Uh, what was your educational background prior to entering service? High school and some college. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I enlisted. Why did you enlist? Uh, I was of draft age and most of uh, my friends were either drafted or enlisted, so I enlisted. Okay. And you selected the Army? Yes. Why? Well, initially okay. I joined the Navy. I didn't join the Navy. I went down to join the Navy. And I was rejected because of a minor medical problem, and that they, I didn't want to wait any further, so mm -hmm. I joined the army. Okay, when, and when did you join? Uh, January of 1949. All right. Um, okay, where did you go for your basic training? Well, initially uh, I went to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and was immediately sent down to Fort Bliss, Bliss Texas. Uh, because the 68th A gun battalion was being uh, reformed. Mm -hmm. um, no. I took my basic training in Fort Brooks at this test. Okay, so you were immediately assigned to an aircraft battery? Correct. All right. Um, could you tell us about your, your weapons uh, and your training and so on? So the initial training was infantry, basic infantry training, and as soon as that was completed after approximately two months. Uh, we started training uh, uh, with the gun battalion and the gun battalion consisted of uh, 90 millimeter guns uh, which were approximately I think of equivalent to a four to five inch gun. Mm -hmm. uh, there were four batteries in the headquarters that uh, comprised the 68th and we went through training in 1949 uh, right up until the fall of 1949 and the unit transferred to Fort Lewis, Washington. And the rest of my time until August 1950 was at Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay. Now, um, in, a, uh, air, in an aircraft battery, how many, how many guns in a battery? In a the battery there were four guns and I believe each gun, if I recall correctly, uh, had two quad 50 uh, turret guns uh, and of course the unit was also included radar, computer uh, and various uh, generating equipment to operate and, uh, various pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. Now how were the guns moved from place to place? Or? The guns were moved from place to place by, by an M4 which was a supposedly high-speed uh, tractor-tank-like vehicle, a uh, combination of, of a personnel carrier and uh, 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 mobile uh, gun tractor. Mm -hmm. How did you spend most of your time in, in Fort Lewis? Well, I was not assigned to the, to the guns in any form or fashion. Uh, I was in, in communications, uh, responsible uh, for wiring to the guns, equipment, and uh, to headquarters and to the command, command post of each uh, uh, battery. Um, so you were connected by telephone wires? Telephone wires, right. Mm -hmm. It was the only form of communication that was used. Radios were not used. It was strictly hardwired communication. Now, how were they wired? Were they on poles or lay on the ground? A uh, combination of both, but predominantly on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because when we moved into a location, of course, we couldn't erect poles. Right. And uh, if there were poles available, which were rarely used, uh, although we did have pole climbing training, uh, it was predominantly uh, ground level wiring. So you had the old crank type uh, crank land type phones? Telephones, right. Okay. I don't recall the nomenclature. Mm -hmm. 
Did you find you had many problems with the equipment at all? Or? Well, uh, at the time I wasn't aware of some of the problems. I did know some of the problems relative to communication, but uh, subsequent to my service, I've read material that indicated that the uh, detractors or the M4s did have problems working in sand, which we had quite a bit of in, in Fort Bliss. And when we went out to Yakima Valley, that was a, a sandy area, and the, the, there were problems with the, with the tractors. Mm -hmm. Now your electronics equipment, was most of it up to date or was it, was, was it pre-World War, War II or equipment. World War II? All World War II equipment. I don't recall any or the introduction of any new equipment whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Now when you mentioned the use of computers, they must have been a very Ancient. primitive, at, I mean at the time they were modern. Right. right? The computer was a, a, a fairly large trailer, not as big as a radar uh, trailer, but uh, uh, by comparison today, it certainly didn't fit in your laptop. Now, who was assigned to that? Were you assigned to that at all? Did you? No, uh, that no, or? that was strictly. Uh, they had a uh, a uh, a tracking group. They had the radar group. Uh, uh, it, there was also a tracking head that was connected to the computer in some form or fashion that did the tracking of the equipment to be fired on. I had nothing to do with radar or uh, the uh, computer equipment. I was strictly a, uh, a lineman, lineman type. Mm -hmm. I had approximately, eventually, I was uh, a, a, ba a uh, battery communication sergeant in charge of about uh, approximately six to eight men. Now what were your jobs then basically? Wiring the complete unit mm -hmm. uh, for the communication uh, operation which was somewhat antiquated, uh, and I say that only because upon my uh, discharge, I started working for the telephone company. Some of the work was similar to military work, but of course the uh, equipment and operation was a little more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Now was there one computer trailer and, and one radar trailer for a whole battery, or? For each battery each had their battery own had their computer own? and radar. Okay. Correct. Were there any civilians involved, or was it just strictly, no, strictly military? strictly military. No civilians involved, to my knowledge. What was daily life like at, at Fort Bliss? You know, routine, uh, uh, daily training, uh, maintenance of equipment, uh, periodic uh, uh, movement to firing range, uh, having fire firing exercises and setting up uh, the unit for combat-related mm -hmm. operations. How many men in a battery, approximately? Yeah, approximately, I'd say 80, 80 or so. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not positive of that for you, but approximately. Okay. Now, who commanded a, a battery? Battery was commanded by a captain. Okay. And your whole unit then? Uh, your whole gun battalion was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel okay. And do you know how many approximately were in that? The total unit? Mm -hmm. About 800. Well, it varied over the period of time I was in, mm -hmm. but it. Uh, I think the the uh, most amount at any one time was in the 800s. The least amount was probably in the four. Uh, and I say that because I forget the exact time, but. Uh, in Fort Bliss, many of the uh, draftees were released short of their uh, full commitment, I think 20 months, and that reduced the unit by a considerable amount, mm -hmm. uh, to the extent we were on demand on, on everything. And until the Korean War breakout, uh, that was not re... Uh, it, uh, they won't remand, so mm -hmm. to speak. Okay. Um, so when did you leave Bliss? I uh, left Bliss in the fall of 1949. Where did you go from there? To Fort, uh, to Fort Bliss, uh, to, excuse me, to Fort Lewis, Washington. Okay, and, and then when, how long were you at Fort Lewis? Fort Lewis from uh, November, October, November, uh, November, I think, of 1949 
until August of 1950 when we shipped out to Korea. All right, now your whole unit went together? Yes. What kind of ship did you go on? We went on the infamous General Black, and I say infamous for the simple reason that it took us approximately 26 to 28 days to go to uh, Yokohama, Japan. It should have taken approximately 12 days because we were caught in two storms. And uh, the General Black uh, on one occasion lost its engines and we listed almost 42 degrees. I uh, had a few incidents uh, of injuries. Uh, some of the equipment shifted and unfortunately, but not due to the storm, we had an individual that was killed aboard ship. Uh, what happened? Uh, during the course of our trip, uh, which we did not stop at any location. Uh, we did uh, firing exercises off the fantail, and in one incident, uh, an individual accidentally, or someone, we don't know who, uh, didn't clear a weapon, and it was hanging from the top of a bunk, and somebody went by and went bang, bang, and two rounds uh, killed an individual. And I remember him well. His name was... Enoch de Jesus from New York City. Okay, um, when you reached Japan, uh, what happened? We reached uh, Japan, and prior to that, a an advance ship had sailed from uh, Fort Lewis to Sasebo, Japan. Uh, we landed in Yokohama and transferred to another ship and went on to Sasebo. Uh, I can't recall how long we stayed there, and then shortly thereafter, we boarded LSTs to Busan, Korea. Mm -hmm. when, did, when did you arrive in Korea? Arrived in Korea approximately 1 September, I guess. Early part of September. 1950? 1950. Okay, and you went into Busan? Into Busan. What was your what were your impressions when you you landed? Well, uh, of course I didn't know it at the time, but mm -hmm. since uh, being discharged, I've gone to uh, about 14 years of reunions, and I learned quite a bit more. Uh, when we went into Pusan, we were supposedly went in as a an anti aircraft unit uh, guarding Pusan Harbor. However, we shortly learned after that uh, all of the equipment uh, relative to any aircraft, radar, computer, generators, etc., quad 50s, were left behind and we assumed the role of a field artillery unit. Now, what kind of weapons were you issued for? Same, the 90mm guns. Same, the 90mm, okay. Did your role change at all? That once you became a quote artillery unit, did you uh, still no? Just... I was. We were still responsible for wiring uh, to the guns, uh, wiring to the command post of the of the battery, and wiring to headquarters for firing missions. Mm -hmm. right. And we had some personnel that acted as forward observers. Uh, we did some patrols. Uh, even though I was in the communication, I was part of these patrols. Uh, we were searching out, I guess, uh, the enemy, so to speak. Uh, but aside from that, uh, uh, my primary duties was uh, wiring the, the units. Uh, so what, did you carry a weapon? Yes. What did you carry? 30 caliber Garand. Okay. Did you face any problems with the enemy uh, cutting lines or wires or anything uh, like that? Yes, there were inc incidents, but I can say they were uh, cut by the enemy. But uh, on occasion, I did have to take a couple of men out in the darkness of night to search down uh, breaks in the wire. Mm -hmm. uh, my one incident I recall clearly went out at night uh, with an officer. Lieutenant Jim Bloom, again, you don't forget names when you, and we were wired, wiring, had wires running to the British 27th Brigade, 
and uh, we lost contact and we went out to make the necessary repairs. Okay. And there, one, there were one or two other occasions of uh, similar incidents, uh, but uh, no more than one or two or three. Were there any times you were under fire yourself? Or? Not uh, small arms fire. We did have a couple of men that were under small arms fire, mm -hmm. but basically uh, it was just uh, a counter battery firing that mm -hmm. we encountered. Now did you stay in the Pusan area or did you move around? Oh no, no. Uh, the whole unit moved from the Pusan perimeter and after the breakout, which I believe was the first CAV, after the breakout we traveled uh, the length of Korea to within about 15, 18 to 15 miles of the Yellow River. And in that time we supported the 24th Division the 5th Regimental Combat Team, the 1st Cav, the ROK, the British 27th Brigade, and a few other units that mm -hmm. uh, I don't recall. Did you ever have much contact with the Korean uh, ROK Army or Korean people themselves? Well, we had interpreters, mm -hmm. uh, one specifically, and again, for some reason, <clears throat> you only remember certain names, but his name was Kim Jin Suk. I, I wouldn't forget that. and. Uh, he was with us most of the time uh, when we did cap had some captured uh, North Koreans, and he did the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interpreting, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, were you in the re fall back from that area also? Yes, we were. After the, what, the China, when the Chinese entered, we were involved in what was called at the time the strategic withdrawal. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Cold and wet. Uh, what kind of equipment did you have? Good equipment. Uh, well, as I said, it was all it was all uh, uh, World War II equipment. Uh, we had some incidents. Uh, I recall, and I don't think it happened in Korea. I think it happened in Washington, in the state of Washington, in Fort uh, uh, Lewis, when uh, I did witness the forward. I can't recall what they called it on the carbine. Flew off. In other words, the wooden piece from the oh, top okay, of the, the following uh, right. Yeah. And uh, there were incidents of misfiring. Uh, probably the most uh, <coughs> ineffective <coughs> weapon that I was aware of was the old, I think it was a 3.2 bazooka that just bounced off, although I didn't witness it, mm -hmm. but bounced off the, the uh, North Korean tanks. Uh, was very ineffective. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the the rations that we had were all World War II. Uh, you'll see, and I think there was a K ration. And then, of course, when we were in what might be considered semi permanent locations, we had uh, Class A or A rations. You, you said they were World War II rations. Were they? Did they have the World War II dates on them? Or uh, the I, I believe so. Uh, and they were the old green hard tack, and the gum was. Stale, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but most of it was, to my knowledge, was World War. That was the the, the uh, uh, I can't yeah, don't hold me to the nomenclature again. But I believe the K ration was the can, and the C ration was a little better. Mm -hmm. But I believe it was all World War Two okay. stored uh, supplies. Now, how did you uh, keep warm in the strategic withdrawal? Uh, it was difficult keeping warm, uh, obviously when it was cold, uh, because again, most of the equipment we, we had was, was World War II. And the worst thing were the boots. Mm -hmm. We had the old, uh, I think they're called muck racks. Uh, it was the rubber bottom with the leather top, and you had insoles that you inserted. And what happened, you would perspire and then you'd get in the cold and those things would freeze and the rubber used to freeze. Uh, I recall one incident just arriving in, in, in uh, Pusan and we had to dig in. And we, well, we, we, it wasn't a foxhole, it was just a, a shallow trench. And I had on the wet weather gear because we had this old black wet weather gear and that night it froze and we had missed uh, a little rain, mist, and sleet 
when I get up in the morning, I, I thought, I, I was like, felt like I was in cement. I couldn't move because I was frozen. Uh, and it happened to uh, many other guys. Uh, during the period uh, from September to, I think, into December, as we got into the cold weather, it was severe cold. Uh, real cold. Uh, it bundled up as best you could. And of course, we just had sleeping bags. Uh, and I, I can't say that, that was, they were World War II sleeping bags, but uh, I believe they were. I'm not mm -hmm. positive about it. I, I don't recall being told that here we have a new piece of, of wearing uh, uh, garment or uh, equipment that was uh, a new innovation of any mm -hmm. kind. To the best of my knowledge, everything was World War II mm -hmm. equipment. Did you ever suffer from frostbite? Uh, no, we had some, but I, I didn't personally, no. How'd you keep your feet dry? Did you keep changing socks? Ch changing socks and changing those insoles, drying them out over fire, drying the best way you could. Uh, no, what did you stay in? Did you stay in tents or did you dig bunkers? Either, uh, bunkers, uh, uh, holes, uh, pup tents, uh, and then when we went back to uh, the uh, aircraft, uh, operation, any aircraft operation, we were in tents, uh, squad tents. Uh, we did winterize to some extent with uh, wooden sides. Uh, we did winterize uh, our three-quarter ton trucks with plywood paneling. Uh, uh, and kept as warm as you could. But uh, it was cold, I have to emphasize. Cold was uh, an enemy, so to speak. Uh, Did you uh, ever see any USO shows while you were there? No, but there were some, but I personally didn't see them. I believe Marilyn Monroe was in one, Bob Hope may have been in another, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I never went to one. Mm -hmm. um, what were your officers like? Uh, effective. Uh, I was not that close. Uh, my recollection, and I, I've learned something in going to my reunions, that an awful lot of the officers uh, 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 were not familiar with communications. Uh, as a matter of fact, a, uh, a deceased officer, uh, uh, deceased since the war, uh, wrote a report that, again, I read at a reunion, that he said that one of the recommendations were, had to be improvement, number one, in the M4s that I referred to before, mm -hmm. uh, also in the communication and radar. Uh, for instance, we never used radios, and I don't understand why. I had radio equipment that just was not used. One of the reasons that uh, I believe was the ineffectiveness over mountains and, and uh, we had uh, FM radios, but FM radios are supposed to be more effective than FM as far as the straight line communication. But we never used, ra or rarely used radios. The enemy used to use their radios and they used to voice Morse code. Uh, de -da, da 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 We never had anybody that was trained in, in Morse code. Uh, however, I did learn again going to my reunions that uh, uh, when the unit returned to any aircraft status, things improved immensely. Uh, newer equipment, uh, radio communication, uh, improvements on the guns. I think the gun was uh, 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 an A1A2 as, as opposed to an A1A1. Uh, I don't know if there's any improvement in the uh, mobile uh, pulling equipment. I wasn't, I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. Was your unit integrated at all? Yes. We were one of the first units that were integrated. Uh, I, I don't recall when that happened, but it had to be in the spring of 1950. So what happened before you went over overseas? Uh, excuse me. I said it went over in August of 50. It was in the spring of 51. Okay. Right.
Were there any problems or tensions or anything like that, or did everyone work together and get Not along? to my knowledge, there were. Uh, I don't know of any incidents, but uh, again, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know the whole, you know, what may have happened in other batteries, but as far as I know. You know. Okay. Do you have ever, ever any wax integrated in your small unit? Uh, in the battery? In the battery? Yes. 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 Okay. yes. But in your group that you worked with in community? Oh, uh, no, I didn't have any. Mm -hmm. No. No. Okay. Um, what were your? Did you ever have much interaction with the Korean people? Limited. Uh, no, I, I didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, aside from uh, some of the later on, some of the uh, uh, Koreans that did the laundry and stuff like that, and, and maybe uh, did some uh, menial work, uh, I was not in contact. In your withdrawal from the yellow, um, what were conditions like? You must have been on the move constantly. Yes, uh, on the move constantly and ran into uh, other uh, UN troops, uh, specifically ran into a Turkish unit and a Greek unit. Uh, when I say ran into, we mm -hmm. met yes. them on the way. Uh, and again, I recall one incident, uh, don't ask me what we were, I don't think we were on patrol, but I do recall coming across, uh, I think they were Turkish tr troops, and they were opening cans of peaches and with their, their like a machete or some type of long blade. Mm -hmm. And I remember the turbans, and uh, other than, oh, I came, we came across uh, an, an Australia unit. Again, I don't know, I don't recall the unit mm -hmm. name, but we came across them. Uh, that's about it. How long were you in Korea? One year, four, well, one year and four months. Uh, it's the seven days, I'm not sure. That, that may have been uh, during the period of going to a rebel depot uh, and being... Uh, that was another experience, not to jump around, but when we... I think I left Kimpo Air Force Base, then we were in an anti-aircraft unit, and we had to be deloused. All our clothing was taken away from us completely. And we had to walk through a tent in a nude and sprayed all over. And then we gave we were given uh, uniforms, one set of ODs, uh, one set of everything. And we had that one set through the uh, Repel Depot or Replacement Depot in Japan, and then set off on a uh, uh, a naval transport ship uh, to uh, California. Did you get much time off in, in Japan at all? I was out over in R and R. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, right after. I think I can't recall if it was. I think it was after our return from up north. Uh, again, flew flew on a C forty seven. I don't recall where we landed in Japan. I, I, I believe it's in Tokyo, around the Tokyo or Yokohama. I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. Tokyo, Tokyo or Yokohama area. And after, again, I don't know how many days, flew back on a C-47 and then either went into the airfield at, at Tegu or, or Kimpo. After you uh, left Japan and to go home, um, how long were you in the service? So. A full three years. Okay, so you left in By January of uh, 1952. Okay, so almost in a day. When you you uh, left Japan, where did you go in the states? Uh, Pittsburgh, California. And how landed in the Presidio, mm -hmm. and then transferred to a ferry of some type up the or down the whatever river. And uh, left from, flew from Camp Stone, which I believe is closed today, uh, to uh, McGuire in Jersey, and was discharged from Camp Kilmer. Mm -hmm. Okay. When were you discharged? You just told me, I know. But, well, I was, uh, the exact date, I don't know because. Okay, that's. We, 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 we arrived in Kilmer just prior to Christmas of 1951. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I remember that vividly, 
because we were put into unheated barracks. <coughs> we were issued a mattress and whatever, a blanket. Uh, no additional clothing, the same clothing we came from in Japan. And we couldn't find out if we were going to be uh, allowed to go home for the Christmas holiday. And uh, so there was a little finagling going on. And we actually went AWOL. Nobody said a word. Nobody said anything. We come back and we all discharged. How long were you gone? Uh, I think just for the week, just till after Christmas. Mm -hmm. Because right after Christmas, I was discharged on January 5th, I think. So it was from whatever date in, in December until uh, my discharge in January. How did you get home? Uh, from? Well, when you went AWOL, where did you go then? Did you... Uh, by, by train. We went okay, by train. train. I, I don't recall how we got mm -hmm. from, from uh, New York to Jersey, but it was by train. Mm -hmm. And then when I got discharged from Kilmer, by train again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did, after you left the service, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Yes, I went to college, back to college. Okay. I never completed, but I did mm -hmm. take advantage of it. Did you join any veterans organizations? No, I've never joined a veterans The only connection I had with the military was in 1994. I was sitting at, in a barber shop right here in Saratoga Springs, and I was reading a VFW magazine and saw my outfit was having a reunion. So I rode away to... Uh, uh, then, as I know, Lieutenant uh, Ritz, and I asked him uh, if there would be any of any people I would know being in the service from from uh, uh, in Korea from uh, 50 uh, to 51, and he said, "Yes, I'm sure you'll meet a couple." And not knowing, I didn't recall at the time, he was in the outfit when I was in the outfit. So I went there and I did meet, I might say, a handful of. Fellows, I know. Mm -hmm. How many reunions have you been to now? Uh, this year will be my 14th. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's still a large a number that. A good number. It's starting to, yeah. as many in the world War, World War II know, that they're starting to peter out. But we still get, uh, I think we were in, no, I know we were in Oklahoma City, but I think we had about about 90 the last go around, including spouses. And, mm -hmm. I really enjoy it. I, I have met a few new people over the years. Uh, by new, I mean re reacquainted. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody remembers incidents that you've forgotten and they rehash them, but sometimes they multiply them by mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. or ten. Now, do you stay in contact with anyone at, I outside stay, of the reunions? Yes, I stay in front, uh, in contact with a very good friend of mine, Vincent Perraro, who was uh, originally a radar operator, who ended up uh, becoming a battery commander. He stayed in the service for five years. He still lives in Westchester County. And I keep in touch with another fellow by uh, uh, a good friend, Sal uh, Papilla, and he was in the computer group, and he lives on Long Island. And we've gone to, well, Perraro has been going to the reunions, I think, since 1989. And Vince and uh, Sal Papilla has gone to the last two or three. So I keep in touch with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to contact, we do have a couple of uh, very active people who try to keep uh, addresses and names and update. And a lot of the material that I, I, I'm referring to my mind right here, came from a chief warrant officer by the name of Frank Baker, who was in the 68th, not during my time, but has gone to many of the last reunions. And he spent a good, uh, considerable, uh, spent 36 years in the service, and ended up being in personnel in Washington, D.C., and he has gone through the archives, the in the aircraft artillery and the Army, uh, journals to find out a lot of the information that I had forgotten about mm -hmm. completely. And he's still with us and he still comes up with new material all the time. And uh, another lieutenant who was a lieutenant of D battery, uh, I 
I met on a few occasions at the reunion, who ended up becoming uh, a general, a lieutenant general, Dick Fazakali. And he retired. He's blind today, so he doesn't come to the reunions anymore. But I remember him well. Uh, one of the best soldiers that, and officers that I've ever met. I still keep contact, although I haven't in the last two years, with a well, Lieutenant Jim Bloom, who ended up uh, career, uh, retired as Lieutenant Colonel, and he was in charge of communications in, in the battery. Uh, communications radar, the whole, the whole uh, range group. Uh, I haven't contacted him in the last year or two. He hasn't gone to the reunions, but uh, he went to four or five. How do you think your time in the service changed or had an effect on your life? I, I, I would say the discipline, uh, the uh, regimentation certainly helps. Uh, I was not familiar with communications of any kind at the time. Uh, upon my discharge, I, as I mentioned, I was with the telephone company for uh, a total of 25 years, but uh, actually it was 18. And the rest of my time, I was with the Communication Workers of America. So I taught for 35 years, and I retired as the upstate New York, New England area director for the Communication Workers. So I've been surrounded by communications most of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Thank you.